Good afternoon, and thank you all for being here with us on Tuesday, August the 11th. It's a good day to be an American, a good day to be a Mississippian, and I appreciate everyone tuning in today. We know that we had another a very good day uh, of numbers, uh, at least relative to where we have been for the last four or five weeks. Um, we can we we can celebrate that fact, but we must also realize that. Uh, uh, the, the trends will only continue if we do the right things. We cannot rest easy, uh, and we cannot start to ignore the risks that are out there. Uh, but we can be hopeful and confident in our path forward. Your efforts are working. Let me say that again. Your efforts are working. You are making a difference. Uh, too often, it is hard to see the progress that is being made with this global pandemic. Too often, we focus only on that which scares us. Some choose only to highlight the bad in an attempt to coerce the right kind of behavior. I believe we need to highlight the impact that your decisions are having. We can be honest because I trust you. When things are bad, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to tell you things are bad. I've had to do that a lot over the last six months. When they're getting better, I'm going to sit here and tell you that they're getting better. And that's what I'm doing today. Two weeks ago, we saw 1,342 new cases. Today, we had less than half of that. That's good. It shows that we're beginning to turn the corner. But we're only beginning to turn the corner because of the decisions that you have made. It is becoming more and more clear that masks work. Masks work far better than shutdowns. We can do this. We can make a difference. But we must continue to be diligent. We must continue to do everything right. We must continue to make good decisions. When we go into public, we need to wear a mask. We need to make sure we socially distance. We need to stay away from large parties or large gatherings. We need to stay away from gathering around bars. We can continue to stay focused and continue to stay smart. Please, I urge you, don't back off now. If we can continue to reduce the transmission in our communities, we can continue to see positive results in our classrooms. Hopefully, we can continue to see positive results on our athletic fields. Hopefully we can continue to see life that we can operate under in a way that is more similar to what we're accustomed rather than what we've gone through for the last six months. But for us to do that, we need your help. We need you to continue to work hard. We need you to realize that we do still have a statewide mask mandate in Mississippi, and there's a reason for that. It's because the mask, the social distancing, you doing what you do is making a difference. My request of you today is simple. Please do not back off now. Now is the time to crush the enemy. And the enemy is not one another. The enemy is the virus. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dobbs and let him give us an update. Very good. Thank you, Governor. Um, today we're reporting 644 new cases and 33 additional deaths. Um, we have seen some moderation in the daily case counts, and this is also consistent with other lines of evidence that we're seeing some moderation in transmission. We're seeing a flattening of new hospitalizations, although we're still having uh, significant stress on the capacity of, of these hospitals. Uh, we have um, uh, also um, seen a decline in test numbers that reflects decreased demand. So we do believe this is a real moderation in the number of daily cases, but it's not any, nothing that we want to let our guard down. As we have before, we let our guard down in May and we suffered severely for it. So now we need to make sure we double down, follow up on the mask use, make sure that we maintain social distancing and avoid groups as much as we possibly can. If we look at our deaths, though, so far we've reported 1,944 deaths throughout the state. I would like to talk about uh, death reporting just a little bit. Um, the vast majority of these have confirmed 
uh, viral testing. So a death with confirmed viral testing, 1,879 of these deaths have confirmed viral testing. Another 65 were called coronavirus deaths, but they didn't have testing. Whenever we get those, we do vet them to make sure that they have syndromes such as pneumonia or respiratory distress syndrome consistent with coronavirus before we'll accept that as a possible uh, cause of death. Please know that the person who puts the cause of death on the death certificates are the physicians and the coroners. We have no role in assigning cause of death on the death certificates. Um, and sometimes if we do get a death certificate that has coronavirus on there, and we review the case and it seems not relevant to their death, if it's a car accident or some other sort of medical syndrome that is not related to, to coronavirus death, such as pneumonia or respiratory failure or those sorts of things, or sepsis, then we will actually discount the death. But please, let me repeat, we do not assign cause of death. That is something that's done by the, the physicians in the corners and almost all the reports that we get directly come from hospitals and nursing homes where sadly patients are, are most frequently dying. If we look at the school situation, we currently have 27 schools with uh, reported coronavirus cases with a total of 42 cases. 17 of those are staff members and 25 are students. The counties where these schools are are the following. Webster County, Tippa County, Tate County, Pontotoc, Forrest, Jones, Winston, Jackson, Holmes, Grenada, Chickasaw, Lowndes, Pearl River, and Union. We are working uh, with the schools. We have a, um, a web form to submit weekly data from the schools so that we can have aggregate information that we will share with the public. It will be on our website and be available to everyone to see. Um, we're still communicating with the schools to make sure we get that information on a regular basis. And please, schools, make sure that you submit that data on a weekly basis. We don't want to have to to track you down. Uh, we need it to make sure the public can have the best information. If we look at safety at schools, one thing I just do want to reiterate, and there has been some confusion about this, you do need to wear a mask and a face shield does not remove the need to wear a mask. The mask protects you and those around you. The face shield is an added layer of protection for the wearer. And so we certainly think that's a useful thing to do, but if you are in school, if you're a student or a teacher, you need to wear a mask, and if you choose to wear a face shield, that's great, but it does not remove the need to also wear a mask. Some other things that have come up recently, we are getting reports of ongoing lab delays. Um, there are still some commercial labs, as the governor talked yesterday, that are still behind. So um, we know that they're working through that, but um, please talk to your physician or a clinic about that if you have concerns about lab delays. Um, and we are still doing uh, you know, pretty much daily testing at the West Street location, and we're running 24-hour turnaround. So if you need to get tested, we'd love to see you. Also, we still have our clinics around the state for drive-through testing, uh, free of charge, of course. Um, we do get, re we get re complaints from restaurants and businesses from time to time. Please note, if you do have a restaurant that you're concerned about, we do have a place on our website where you can file a complaint, and we will follow up with them. We do obviously license the restaurants, and we have a little bit more interface with those guys on a regular basis. Um, if you do send, um, something to us on businesses, we will communicate with them and let them know of the uh, different rules that they should be following. And the last thing I just want to mention real quickly, um, there has been some conversation about uh, myocarditis or an inflammatory condition of the heart related to coronavirus. Um, as you may have seen, there were uh, five Big Ten football players recently tested positive for myocarditis. It's an inflammatory condition of the heart related to the coronavirus. Um, we're learning more as we go forward and just know we'll be following that very closely and try to make sure that you all have as much information as you need. I have been in conversations with uh, cardiologists throughout the state and we'll be working with those medical specialists to make sure that um, we're on top of this as a state. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Dr. Dobbs, for all of your efforts. Um, our uh, excellent director of uh, the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency is, is communicating today with local officials. That's one of the things that we've tried very, very hard to do. Dr. Dobbs and I, uh, Director Michelle and I, uh, and all of us together on numerous occasions uh, having conference calls and, and conversations with those local officials because they play such a critical role in convincing the public to join us in participating in wearing masks and, and, and they certainly have uh, local law enforcement officials and so Director Michelle has is, is been working to, to do more and more of that and so we have his very, very capable 
uh, number two, Mac, here today, uh, who has done a fantastic job uh, on logistics and other things at the agency. And so I'm going to turn it over to Mac. All right. Thank you, Governor. Uh, to report out today, we've got uh, in our public assistance program with COVID, we have 593 applicants as of today. So that program has uh, taken off very well. And we have over 102 on the CARES Act side. So from your counties and municipalities, the cities, uh, municipalities and counties, they, they're all uh, making haste and uh, applying for these programs, getting them approved. And we're, we're processing those to get the monies back to them. If there's any issues with the uh, local governments trying to call. We, we still got the 1-800 number open. It's 844-522-7367. Uh, and that, uh, that line has been well used, Governor. And uh, we've been able to talk applicants through the process to get them qualified. Actually, they show them which lane to go into, whether it's the CARES Act or the Pure FEMA uh, PA Act uh, on that side. So we've been able to do a great job there. So very, very happy with the, with the pro product that we have and uh, the production we're getting out of it. Uh, we, we still continue to have the Mississippi National Guard working with us. Over 56 of those uh, uh, young men and women uh, uh, have been working with us to spread out PPE supplies uh, all over the state. Went over to 58 counties today, and uh, we're at 227,000 miles. So we're, we're gonna continue to, uh, to keep uh, logging that mileage and uh, getting those supplies out to healthcare facilities as well as the, the county EMA directors who have been one of the most powerful elements that we have ever seen uh, in emergency management uh, d during this, this event. I, I know you've said it, Governor, many, many times again, but I, I can't thank the local emergency managers uh, enough. I had a couple of them call me today, and uh, I just told them that, that they are doing the yeoman's work uh, on the front line, and uh, without them, uh, MEMA certainly cannot do it by itself, but we can definitely provide them the mechanisms that, that they may need to do that. Uh, proud to uh, report out today that uh, uh, through MEMA, the Department of Health, and the logistics team with the Guard, we are now a little over 12.3 million items in stock, and that's the primary PPE. So what does that mean? That means I've got 60 days on hand, worst case scenario, at this time. But as, as we ramped up with uh, the more cases last week, that ate into our uh, PPE that we have in stock for the hospitals, whether it's medical masks, gloves, face shields, surgical masks, gowns and coveralls. I saw those numbers sliding less than 60, heading toward 30, but we were able to get some shipments in. So every time there's a surge, there's a surge on our side and we continue to meet it. But as of right now, uh, Governor, you're, you're in good hands. We, we've got you covered. Uh, Dr. Dobbs, we, we can uh, uh, react to whatever needed, but uh, the mask, uh, wearing those in the social distancing works because when I see the stock grow uh, in a warehouse, that, that is an awesome feeling uh, to be able to have that comfort and that security. Uh, sir, that's all I have for today. Thank you, Mac. And you, you said something I just want to reiterate. I have had the opportunity to be on many calls over the last six months with our local emergency management officials and, and Mississippi gets criticized for a lot of things, uh, but I think it is recognized around the country that our uh, emergency management personnel and our structure uh, is second to none. Uh, we have exceptionally capable and competent people at the local level um, that don't worry about politics, don't worry about anything other than helping people. And I'm, I could not be more proud uh, of our men and women at the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency supported uh, by our National Guard, uh, but also our local uh, elected officials and our local emergency management personnel uh, who, like many of us, have worked day and night for months and months and months on end um, and I certainly appreciate their efforts. It means an awful lot uh, to the people of our state and Mississippi is in a better spot today because of your efforts and so I want to thank you personally for what you're doing. Uh, I'd love to tell you that it's over and we don't have to do it anymore but we've got more work to do. We know uh, over the next several months we're going to continue to be fighting uh, this virus just as we have been uh, for the vast majority of this year. So with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Courtney Ann. Uh, Governor, uh, an anniversary of sorts, maybe not the right word, but um, five months since the first reported case, I believe March 11th was the first case here in Mississippi. Um, what lessons learned thus far or message that you and Dr. Dobbs would have to folks who, who maybe are thinking, okay, I didn't think it would be this long, but it does seem like we're moving in the right direction with numbers and some of the things you guys mentioned earlier? Well, that, that's a great question, and, and I didn't realize that it was a 
five-month anniversary um, of, of receiving our first case, uh, the number one lesson learned from my perspective is um, expect the unexpected every single day. Uh, no matter what you plan for, uh, no matter how many hours you spend looking at the data today, uh, it's completely different tomorrow. And so, you know, I think that uh, with the, a pandemic of this magnitude uh, that has affected this many people, not only in our region, not only in our state, uh, but in our entire country and quite frankly around the world, uh, it's very, um, very challenging and, and very unique every single day. Um, other things that I've that, that become more and more clear to me is that uh, we, we, in America we have a very diverse country, whereas many other countries that have some have gotten it worse, some have gotten it, um, some have had it not as bad as, as the U.S. Uh, we just have a very diverse and very large country, and so the first real wave of the coronavirus happened in the Northeast, right? And so. Um, you know, and, and a lot of us, as, as we got through the first two or three months, sort of felt like the first wave was behind us. What I would suggest to you is, in, in large measure, <clears throat> many of the policies that we put in place were successful in slowing down the spread in March and April and May. We, we really flattened the curve. Uh, and then in late May and early June, uh, we found ourselves in a scenario, as Dr. Dobbs mentioned earlier, where perhaps uh, some of us in the state let our guard down and because we thought the first wave was behind us to a certain extent. Um, and I think what we found, and the Vice President and I talked about this uh, uh, a couple of days ago, is what, what we're experiencing in the South right now is probably not the second wave, it's probably the latter part of the first wave. Uh, we saw it in the Northeast, then we saw it sort of California, Arizona, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina. But now, in, in hearing Dr. Burke's talk yesterday and, and just literally spending a few minutes looking at the numbers now, it looks like that sort of the, the wave, if you will, is moving more towards the, the, the Midwest and the upper Midwest. Uh, they're seeing test positivity going up. They're seeing their case numbers inch up. Not huge uh, movements yet, but it's kind of like what we saw in you know early to mid-June. And so I think there are certainly lessons that we can learn from the data uh, in terms of, of what we look at, um, but you know, in terms of where we find ourselves today, um, based upon what we're seeing in terms of new cases, and we know that things like hospitalizations, uh, ICU use, um, ventilator use tend to be lagging indicators because it can take two or three or four weeks um, that with the cases continue to decline, over the next three or four weeks, all other things being equal, we should start seeing hospital utilization decline uh, a little bit as well. And we've already seen it to a certain extent. You know, our, if you look at total um, COVID cases in hospitals across the state, which would be both confirmed and suspected COVID cases, uh, you add those two numbers together, we're down about 10% from the absolute peak a couple weeks ago. But again, they're more flat than they are declining at this point. Hopefully we'll see that roll over and actually start declining on hospitalizations. But all of that is going to be dependent upon our ability to continue to drive the numbers down. We're not going to continue to drive the numbers down sitting at this table. What's going to drive the numbers down is the people that are watching today and their friends and their neighbors and their kids and their grandkids being smart, wearing a mask, not going into large groups. And so, um, you know, I think lessons learned, look, we could. Uh, I've said repeatedly throughout this that uh, there's going to be plenty of time for Monday morning quarterbacking uh, about a year from now, <laughs> but right now it's let's continue to do what we can to to flatten the curve and, and hopefully roll it over. And, and I think to echo a lot of the same points, um, we need to have the long view. This isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, in the summertime, people were ready to throw off the restrictions and go back to normal or even more than normal in some cases, and we've paid the price for it. We just now we've, we're at a state where we have a you know mostly functional economy. Um, people are doing some things with some restrictions. It's different than we would like, but we've got to just stick with it for a while until we have an effective vaccine. We're not likely to see the end of this, and so we're going to look into the next year, right? So um, let's have the long view. Be patient. 
and not minimize the severity of the virus. There's a temptation to minimize it so we don't have to worry about it, and then we end up paying the price for that too. So, speaking of Monday morning quarterbacking, I wanted to ask you about your college football tweet today. Um, you wrote that college football is essential. What do you think opponents of football think kids will end up in a bubble without it? You can get COVID anywhere. Um, earlier this week and previously as well, you said that you don't think it's a good idea for thousands and thousands and thousands of people to attend high school football games. How do you reconcile that statement with saying that college football is essential when clearly college football is a much larger draw of audiences, not only for the games, but for tailgating right. and other socializing? Right. Well, if you read my entire tweet, uh, the end of it uh, is very clear that the way in which you play college football this year is by limiting crowd size um, and let the players play. Um, many of these players have been on college campuses now for months and months. Uh, they have been practicing. Uh, and I, and, and when, I, when I listen to folks like Trevor Lawrence, the, the quarterback at, at Clemson, and, and other uh, athletes, some even here in Mississippi, uh, talking about their um, desire to play, you think about the fact that um, you've got a large number of, of college athletes that are looking to uh, further their career. And in some instances, you've got college athletes that uh, were it not for college football or some other sport, uh, they may not have even had the opportunity to, to get a junior college education or get an opportunity to play, uh, to get a, an education at the collegiate level. And so um, I, I personally uh, would believe that we can, we can play uh, college football. I don't think you can do it in a stadium with 100,000 people in it. That certainly doesn't make any sense. Uh, but, you know, we've been working with our universities, uh, State and Ole Miss and Southern Miss and, and others, uh, looking at the potential for uh, an agreement on what it would look like. And so, you know, look, it's, it's, um, there, there are no easy uh, decisions, I understand, at this point. But we're also not going to ever completely minimize risk um, and mitigate risk to a point of zero We've got to understand that our goal is not to go from, from where we were on March the 11th when we had the first case down to zero cases because that's not a realistic goal. Our goal has to be to protect the integrity of our health care system, which is, I have, if I've said it once, I've said that 500 times from right here, and I believe that we can do that, and I believe that um, particularly given the, uh, the number of testing uh, requirements that have been um, put upon uh, our universities across this country uh, that we can play football, certainly not without any risk, uh, but with minimal risk, uh, and we give those, uh, those kids an opportunity to, to be in school and also uh, to play. Um, Jack from Clearing Ledger has a question. Yeah, just to uh, follow up on what Emily asked. Yeah, in, in your tweet, you said that college football is essential um, you know, what does essential mean to you and why specifically is college football essential? Why not, you know, other maybe college athletics? Well, I, I think that the tweet regarding college football was because there are many um, different commissioners and uh, across the country that are, uh, are certainly looking at this question today. Uh, they have, um, there's been a lot of reports over the last several days um, that up until Friday of last week, there was a significant uh, amount of um, optimism that, that we were going to go forward. The Southeastern Conference, for instance, has already announced that they're going to push back the start date until September the 26th, but that they plan to have a 10-game all-conference schedule. Um, and so for some of these uh, other conferences now to be um, backing up and deciding that they're not going to, uh, I just don't believe – uh, is, a, is the right decision. Uh, when I talk about uh, things that are important uh, to society is we have got to find a way uh, to move through the next three or four months or five months or however long it is until a uh, vaccine is found to operate in a way that is smart but that also affords us the opportunity to live our life. You know. Uh, the question was asked earlier about lessons learned. When we were sitting here in March and April, everyone was talking about um, when are we going to completely shut down our economy? 
when are we going to completely shut down our economy? And, and in our state, we were very reluctant to do that. And in fact, we only had a shelter in place order for uh, a little over two weeks. And because of that, because we kept our economy going, um, we find ourselves today, as I mentioned yesterday, in which uh, our economic recovery uh, in terms of jobs lost in February to April uh, that have returned in May and June is the seventh best in the entire nation. It's because we recognize that there are risks, but there are also actions that we can take to mitigate risk and still continue to live our lives. I believe the same can be said uh, for college football. Uh, I think there are many kids, and by the way, it's not limited just to college football. Uh, there are many kids in high school uh, that, um, that they're, they're, the athletic portion of their day is extremely important to them. And so I believe that there is a way for us to do high school sports in a safe, responsible way. Um, that's not going to include uh, tens of thousands of people in the stands because we know that that's a, an opportunity for a super spreader event. But there is a way for us to have um, sporting events that are safe. Uh, and I think that that's where the conversation should be around college football, not uh, an effort uh, to shut it down. As far as the economic impacts this might have on college football, you know, college football is a big sport here in the Mississippi, brings in a lot of money. And those specific programs um, are used to operating on budgets where they can travel, they can go places, they don't have to worry too much about um, because they bring in so much. Um, are you concerned about, like, if we limit crowd sizes, those programs not having the same kind of funding? And then also are you concerned about, you know, if one person gets coronavirus, uh, you might have 15 people out on the team on, a, on a, any given week. Yeah, I, I will tell you, I, I am concerned uh, about the financial impacts. I'm also concerned uh, about the financial impacts uh, to all of the other uh, sports because uh, particularly uh, at um, the larger universities, uh, there is no doubt that football helps fund not only scholarships but the annual operating budgets of virtually every other sport. I, I saw a stat the other day in which uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of less than 20 total athletic programs in all of America are actually cash flow positive that are not college football. And that just shows you that if you, if you really care about women's track and field or men's soccer or diving at some universities or the other sports, um, it requires uh, significant funding typically from college football and so um, there's an awful lot of kids that are in uh, that are on our college campuses right now that that play sports that are getting full scholarships uh, that depend on uh, some funding there's no question that if we if we start college football in September and let's just say we're at 10 percent or 20 percent or 30 percent capacity they are not going to generate the kind of revenue that they could generate if they were at 100% capacity. But I would submit to you that given the TV revenue and given the uh, reality of 25 or 30% um, capacity, uh, generating that kind of revenue will not, they will have revenue losses relative to what they did last year, but they will generate um, money to the point uh, that they can help fund other programs, which I believe is critically important to an awful lot of student athletes uh, across the state of Mississippi, uh, which I am obviously most concerned about, but it's also true of a lot of student athletes across America. Um, Dave Elliott with WLOX has a question. Thank you, Renee. I hope you don't mind. I'd like to request a, a second question with uh, Dr. Dobbs, if I may. Uh, Governor, uh, we talked about the Department of Marine Resources budget yesterday, but lo and behold, Lawmakers left the Capitol without passing that DMR budget. Problem continues to be in the House. Control over millions of dollars in Go Mesa money. You can call a special session of the DMR on the call. Will you? If so, when will you do that? And what can you do today to keep DMR functioning? Well, thank you for that question, Dave. You, you are, as is often the case, exactly right. The problem continues to be uh, in, the, in the House, and it continues to be uh, about the power of, the, um, of s naming specific certain projects. They are very, very interested in, in their ability to do that. Uh, the Senate is not interested in that. 
uh, and I think correctly so. I appreciate the senators holding their ground uh, and focusing on doing what's best uh, for the coast. Uh, you're right, I do have the opportunity to call a special session. We are, we are currently in conversations about uh, if it is time for us to do that, and if so, uh, when that may be. Uh, no final decision has been made at this time, but I am very, um, uh, quite frankly, I'm forced to look at that option. Uh, I felt certain that um, the leadership in the House would recognize that we had funded DMR over the last 15 years in a certain way, and they certainly have the right to change that, but to do so, they got to get the votes to do it. And, um, and I felt like w when they recognized that after their first attempt um, in late June did not work, that they would come in and in good faith pass the agency's budget and then we could fight over something else uh, in the future. But that's not the path that they chose to do. Um, you know, this is uncharted territory. I've been around 17 years. Uh, and even when Billy McCoy was speaker uh, and Haley Barber was governor, um, we, we didn't find ourselves in late, mid to late August with a state agency that wasn't funded. I'll tell you, Dave, my heart breaks for the 150 plus personnel that work at the Department of Marine Resources. Um, they don't deserve to be putting, to be put through this fight. They, they don't know uh, necessarily where their next paycheck's going to come from. Some of them got furloughed on July the 1st. We need to put people before politics and unfortunately oh, that hasn't dollars. happened sir oh, okay uh, thank you governor dr dobbs quickly you talked about students and districts and positive tests down here on the coast today at gulfport high school uh, a staff member exhibiting symptoms this was in mcguire a hundred students now in 14-day quarantine elementary school in ocean springs staff member uh, with symptoms actually testing positive 13 students now in a 14-day quarantine consistent with protocols at both schools are you satisfied with that kind of protocol in that situation are you concerned that this is just going to keep happening every day one school after another um it's going to keep happening to some degree um i i would say that it's a bit of a disappointment to have to quarantine that many people um, under the under the current guidance, if you can maintain the proper spacing of six feet and more per student, uh, then there is not a mandated quarantine. And and so to me that suggests that our classes are too crowded. Um, just to be quite honest, um, we haven't done a successful job in sort of blending different schedules and then and then online learning uh, sort of combinations. Um, otherwise, we're going to continue to see this. It's just it's just inevitable until we can get our community transmission down considerably. Um, uh, you know, this, this is uh, uh, information that we hadn't received yet. We have it's not been reported to us yet. And that's going to happen because, you know, the Facebook reporting mechanism is the fastest there is nowadays. Um, but we'll continue to monitor these things. But the choir worries me a lot, right? We know singing is a great way to transmit coronavirus. Um, these are things that we've talked about. These are vulnerabilities. And we may have to um, really try to reinforce with the school districts to try to take those next steps. Everybody's so anxious to get back to normal. Um, I would actually say, why don't we sort of go baby steps um, before we do some of these things? I understand people miss school, but we, we're going to have to be really conscientious about the simple things. And improved spacing is going to be one of those big, big components. I would just follow up by saying, um, I am definitely concerned uh, about the number of cases, and I'm definitely concerned uh, about the quarantine of students. But I will tell you that I would be more concerned if there were, n there were no quarantines and there were no cases because I would be concerned that the schools were not doing what they needed to do to identify the cases and then, um, and then quarantining the students and slowing down the spread of the virus. And so uh, we know that there are going to be cases. We are seeing less community transmission. That's a positive. That's a very good thing as we go into the next couple of weeks. Hopefully that trend will continue. Uh, but I do, to answer Dave's question, I do anticipate um, and, and believe that we are going to have cases in our schools just like we would have kids test positive and adults test positive if we were not in school. Um, the fact is there is community transmission and, and there are some individuals that are uh, contracting the virus. Bobby. Governor, just following up on the 
marine resources issue again. How long are you going to keep on keeping the agency going, and how long can you? I know you said it's uncharted territory. And then also just following up on any additional thoughts on the session yesterday and that's been the veto and just those two issues. Yeah, no, I, I think um, I will tell you that I, I am surprised that they uh, did not uh, fund the Department of Marine Resources budget. I felt like that was the, one of the primary reasons that they were coming in. It's the reason they called themselves in and paid themselves um, a per diem and, and other things. So I'm, I'm surprised that they decided to leave without doing that. Uh, but again, we are left with making a decision because they didn't fund a state agency that has been funded in a certain way for 15 years. I can't answer today exactly uh, what uh, that looks like, but we are certainly having conversation, and that includes uh, with our legal staff, with the Finance Administration legal staff, with the uh, Department of Marine Resources legal staff, um, and trying to figure out exactly what that looks like. Do, what, what obligation do we have at this point, uh, and can we continue to keep the agency open? Um, so what was your other question? I'm sorry. Any final thoughts on the, the session as a whole yesterday and the veto? veto? Well, I, I thought the, the I thought the outcome of yesterday was uh, excellent. Um, I vetoed the uh, K through 12 education bill because they did not fund the school recognition program. Uh, that is a program where 23,157 teachers were entitled to nearly $30 million in, in compensation that they had earned. And so I was extremely pleased uh, that the legislature uh, agreed with my position that they needed to fund uh, that $30 million. Now, I, I'll point out, and I think it's important, uh, we saw a lot of Republicans in the House and the Senate say that they had uh, always intended to fund the program. And if that's true, um, then hopefully we won't have to have this debate and this conversation next year, that they'll, they'll go ahead and fund it uh, when they pass the appropriation bill. And so I, I'm, I'm excited about that. I think it's uh, really uh, a good thing. Uh, that we were able to get that $30 million for those 23,157 teachers, uh, and I'm real excited about that. Um, Hunter Dawkins with the Gazebo Gazette has a question. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Governor. Governor, a question for you is, and I'm not trying to be repetitive from yesterday, but, but as far as it goes with uh, a bunch of the athletic coaches that I've talked with from different sports, have mentioned to me, you know, what's what what is the deal? Are we gonna have a timeline or we're gonna have a size capacity level, whatever it takes place with that. And I know that you had a conversation, at least a few, I'm sure, with the MHSAA directors, and where are we going from here and how are we gonna move forward? Yeah, the, those conversations are ongoing. I had multiple conversations earlier today regarding that. Um, as it currently exists under the existing execu executive orders, uh, ca they can have a capacity of no more than 25% in an outdoor venue. Uh, we are having conversations as to whether or not we should limit that uh, further. Uh, having, we had conversations with Dr. Dobbs late last week. We've had conversations with various uh, interested parties over the last several days, and we're not ready to announce anything today, but we certainly would expect to do so in the very near future. Jackie with WHBQ has a question. Uh, seeing that I'm muted, um, Dave with WLOX has another question. Okay, here we go. Uh, Governor, yesterday you talked extensively about unemployment benefits. There was some confusion over the president's executive order. Uh, White House economic advisor, advisor Larry Tuttle kind of cleared up, I think, today. Mississippi pays $235 uh, a week. The state will add 100 out of its own pocket, and then the Fed will contribute $300. Uh, is that how you see it? And is that a budget buster for the state's trust fund? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, we are certainly uh, looking into that topic as well. Uh, the president signed the executive order uh, over the weekend. I, I want to thank the president for taking action. Um, the, the reality is that the Democrats have a $3.4 trillion plan 
uh, that is completely devoid of reality. They're asking for $950 billion for state and local governments, uh, which is a, an astronomical number that is not at all realistic. Uh, with respect to the $100, my estimation is that that additional $100 would cost the trust fund in Mississippi approximately $22 million per week. We currently are spending between $21 and $23 million per week. Uh, if we added the $100, that would mean we would have $45 million per week uh, coming out of the trust fund. And we started this process with $706 million. Even after the legislature gave us $181 million, we only have $489 million left in that trust fund. So if we were to add that $100, we could potentially run out of money in the trust fund within approximately 10 weeks. Uh, I am very concerned about that. And so we haven't made a final decision yet, uh, but it certainly uh, would present major financial challenges for the trust fund. And keep in mind, you know, it's easy to stand up here and say it would create financial challenges for the trust fund. But at the end of the day, the trust fund is just the mechanism. Who pays for it is the employers and ultimately the employees. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, the potential for a significant tax increase on small businesses, and we're going to work really hard to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, the legislature is probably going to have to put more money in the trust fund. I think that's going to be critically important in the, in the weeks ahead, uh, and we're going to uh, work with them to make sure that, uh, that they uh, understand that when Ms. Uh, Turner recommended $500 million in CARES Act funds, uh, that was a real number based upon real expectations. And keep in mind, all of this and all these financial challenges are in lieu of the fact and even because we had one of the five most healthy trust funds in America in March, and also we have had the seventh fastest growth in jobs from what we lost in March or April in America and we're still looking at these financial challenges. So I'm very concerned about it, um, and we, we haven't made a final decision yet uh, as to whether or not we're going to jump in. Governor, so I read, I'm sorry. Okay. I, as I, I mean, just keeping on that track for just a second, I, I mean, I read something, I don't, I, I don't know if anybody knows for sure yet, but that there was a story that they understood that you could take like 100 million out of that 235 you were already paying and count that toward the have you heard that? Which that would not be an additional drain on the trust. Yeah, I have heard that. Uh, I have not been able to confirm it uh, in writing yet, and so we're in obviously communications with the administration and trying to get that uh, confirmed to see if that is actually true. You know, the the in the way in which the president did it is through the Stafford Act, and so the question becomes: if there is a state and local match, does the the 235 that we're currently paying in weekly uh, contributions would part of that count for our, the state's 25% match and I don't have a definite answer of that I I've heard a lot of people speculate but I don't have a definite answer on that yet but I'm looking into it so if someone missing on these numbers if $245 a week costs the state $22 million how does $100 a week cost the same amount like what am I missing there yeah so it's the uh, number of people that are eligible for uh, the, the PUA, the Pandemic un in Unemployment Assistance, is different than the number of people who are eligible for normal state benefits. And so, for instance, um, I'll give an example. Uh, if you are working in a restaurant, but you're only working part-time, well, you're not, part-time is not necessarily eligible for typical state benefits, but you are uh, eligible for, um, the PUA under the Federal CARES Act. The other thing is not everybody makes 235, so some make $50 a, uh, a week, et cetera. So, okay, thank you. yeah, sure. Yes. Yes. Um, I want to follow back up on the sports um, football thing. Um, some athletic directors are saying they're concerned that there's going to be additional costs as well, uh, just because of protections from coronavirus as they travel. Um, are you concerned about football players uh, as they travel to other states, as they travel even like within Mississippi? Uh, for other football games. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about everything. Um, and, and there's certainly going to be risk, and there's certainly additional cost. Uh, the, the, there's, there's no doubt about that. that there's additional testing costs. You know, if, you're, if you have 120 uh, football players and you're getting a test every week, or in some instances two tests every week, there's additional costs there. And so uh, it's certainly um, easier for 
those uh, larger institutions to be able to adhere to that than it is others. And so, you know, I think uh, a lot of these are difficult questions. Most of that is actually being uh, handled at the conference level, uh, where most of our focus has been is on crowd size because it, that's more of the, uh, the, the real uh, public health issue uh, uh, in addition to that for the, the student athletes and the students for that matter. Um, Alex of Mississippi today has a question. Great. Thanks, Renee. Um, Dr. Dobbs, you talked about uh, the kind of uh, lowering test numbers in, uh, in recent days, and I'm just curious, um, and for the sake of having, having the most accurate new case count as possible, if the state has a target in mind for the number of new tests it likes to see? Um, you know, n not really. Um, in, in Mississippi, a lot of the demand is driven by illness. Um, we certainly have uh, a goal for the public health lab. We want to really maximize its output such that we're, we're, we're reaching those high impact communities as much as we can. We are very much hoping we can use the Lexington experience from over the weekend to be more aggressive in different communities. So look forward to some exciting things happening on that front. But, you know, we're kind of, Kind of like most people, or a lot of people in Mississippi don't have a primary care doctor, a lot of people don't get care unless they're sick. So the high testing numbers a lot of times reflects the number of people who are ill and symptomatic. So uh, I wouldn't say that we have some, some sort of artificial target that we want for, for testing. The percent positive will reflect that somewhat as well if people are only going in if they're getting sick. Um, so I, I think it's a good sign to see the decline in, in, in testing demand That'll also help with the private lab capacity and their ability to uh, get fast results. Um, going back to Jackie at WHBQ. Hi, can y'all hear me? All right. So I wanted to ask about the increasing number of cases in schools like Corinth, now Corinth County. Do you think that more should be done inside some of these school districts that are seeing an increase in cases or if it gets to a certain case number in any school in Mississippi, would you guys step in and try and enforce more stricter social distancing guidelines? And then I have another question. Basically, do you think that more of the transmission is coming from within the schools now? I know maybe last week when I asked, you guys were saying you're thinking it's more community transmission, but is it more, are you seeing it more from within the school districts now? Yeah, I'll let Dr. Dobbs uh, fully answer both of those questions, particularly the second one. Um, but I would just simply say, uh, with respect to the schools, we do have guidelines in place whereby we would uh, shut down a particular school building or shut down a particular school classroom uh, or shut down a particular school district. We will uh, continue to monitor that. I don't believe we've reached that point uh, in any district at this, at this point in time, uh, but, um, but we're certainly willing to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And if we look at where kids are getting it, still now it's they're bringing it with them. We don't have any evidence of transmission within a school, um, not yet. It, that's one of, one of the things that's really difficult, though, is the quarantine piece, right? So it's very disruptive to the learning environment when a large proportion of kids have to be out. Um, so my message to parents and to church leaders is please... Um, Please don't do unnecessary stuff outside of school. If your kid's doing something in school that's safe and they're socially distanced and wearing a mask, it's the same thing they should be doing outside of the school. There's nothing magical about not being in a school that lets you not catch coronavirus when you get with a bunch of friends and go do something. So that's what's going to really be our, our Achilles heel. It has been the whole time. Is, are these sort of social family get-togethers where we have groups of people, we have um, unstable sort of cohorts where people are moving in and out, that's where you have your vulnerability. Uh, so um, that's gonna be a real challenge. So please do, so, do the social distancing thing, wear a mask under every scenario, don't let your guard down. Uh, Governor, you, you delayed school reopenings in several counties. Um, uh, for, just to give it more time to see if things could turn down. I, mean, I know we still have another week until schools reopen on the 17th in those counties, but are, have you been encouraged by the progress you've seen there? I've certainly been encouraged by the, the, the numbers over the last uh, really four weeks. Uh, I went through them yesterday, and um, it, it's, a, it's really encouraging to see uh, the declines. 
and and that's something that that I think we as a state should be proud of um, because it's everybody chipping in and doing their part in wearing a mask and staying socially distanced and staying at least six feet apart in not doing unnecessary things that lead to significant spread uh, in the communities we're very fortunate in that regard um, uh, you know I was I was encouraged uh, in fact um, yesterday I saw uh, even in the in the capital some of the pictures that I saw um, I, I saw uh, even legislators were uh, by and large wearing a mask and by and large staying socially distanced and um, and, and we all know that's a far cry from from where they were back a couple of months ago and so that tells me that, that there's more and more uh, awareness uh, in in the state and, and awareness w within our uh, leaders and, and in our legislature and so I'm, I was ha proud to see that and and um, you know it's a I thought uh, getting the, the education budget done uh, was certainly uh, important as well um, I'm glad that they did that and and I'm hopeful that um, if I'm forced to veto any other bills um, in the future uh, I hope that they uh, agree to override those vetoes and then pass legislation doing exactly what I wanted them to do. If we can have that model over the next seven and a half years, uh, I'll be uh, extremely pleased uh, with the veto process. Yeah. I think you guys looked at a lot of different data points and it seems like kind of each week a new one becomes the buzzword nationally or maybe just as kind of part of the conversation. Test positivity has been the thing and are not. I know you guys talked about that a little bit more yesterday, but can you guys discuss the significance of seeing that number lower and for people at home outside of kind of layman's terms? Yeah, so the, the r naught value is really the reproductive rate. It's how many, like if I have coronavirus, how many people do I give it to? And if we extrapolate that to the whole population, it's the average transmission rate from one person to the next. If you get that number above one, it means that the pandemic is gonna continue to grow. One person gives it to 1.1 to 2.2 and all that sort of stuff, you know, 4.4, so it grows. But if you get it below one, even if it's like 0.9, that means that the number of people in the population is continually declining. And so that's, it, it's almost like where the exponential spread works against us. If we can get the reproductive rate below one, it works in our favor. So what lowers the r naught value? It's spacing, it's masks. It's small groups. If you're not around a lot of people, you can't spread it to a lot of people. So that's one of the reasons why it's so important. So if we can just just keep the gas on, just let's just keep our, pedal, our our foot on the pedal and you know all the way down. Let's just be really careful, and we can really we can knock it down. I, we we should all be so proud where we are, but we absolutely cannot cannot lose our focus. And we, we were under one yesterday. Is, is that we've gotten? To we've under been one? under one for the last six or seven days, um, but we were we were up around 1.2 for several weeks and that's obviously when you see exponential increases in numbers and so uh, I'm very uh, pleased that we we are under one we need to stay under one and the only way that we can stay under one because it will turn around because we still have we still had 600 plus cases in Mississippi today and if you do if you go at 1.2 that means 600 give it to 720 and then if you're still at 1.2 720 give it to 840 and, and, and you know and it can it, it's exponential and that's that's the challenge with the virus um, is that exponential growth if you're not careful but as dr. Dobbs says it also works in the reverse if you can have it at 0.8 or 0.9 then you can really start seeing numbers decline the way to do that is wear a mask don't go in large groups um, stay spread out, be smart, and, um, and if we'll do that over the next couple of weeks um, until the end of August, it'll go a long way towards really helping drive our numbers down. I, I really do believe that. If we let up our guard and we, we just say, okay, all is good, then it's, it's not going to be great. All right, so you know the questions. I sincerely appreciate everyone being here today, and to all my fellow Mississippians, thank you for what you're doing. Let's double down. Let's work hard. Let's Let's push the gas down, let's wear our masks, let's stay very, very uh, distant from one another, and let's continue to fight this virus. Thank you all.